Kirk Cameron is here to save Christmas. But who's gonna save Christmas from Kirk Cameron? Hello everyone, my name is John and welcome back to Homeless Movies, where I like to give secondhand films a second chance to be appreciated and see if they're still worth watching. And if you like making fun of bad movies as much as I do, make sure to click subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss an episode. And if you want to get all of my episodes at least a day early, along with a couple of other perks, make sure you click the join button to become a member or head on over to my Patreon. Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas came out in 2014 with the sole purpose of putting Christ back into Christmas. It was so universally panned that it's considered one of the worst films of all time. It is consistently on IMDb's bottom 100 list. Kirk Cameron was so angry about everybody hating his movie, he essentially decided that all of the reviews were fake news, and so he had a bunch of his Christian friends go onto message boards leaving fake reviews to make people think that it was just some sort of atheist conspiracy against him. The movie starts with Kirk Cameron playing himself, delivering this extremely long-winded speech from ACROSS THE ROOM, explaining that everything pertaining to Christmas gets him harder than Daddy Derek hearing that the gun show is back in town. I love Christmas. I love the fire. I, I love the presents. I love the stockings. I love the tree. I love the fudge. I love the lights. I love... carpet. Brick, are you just looking at things in the office and saying that you love them? I love lamp. We get it, all right? Christmas is already awesome. And if that's the case, why are we here? What are we even trying to save it from? But have you noticed, there's some people who would love to put a big wet blanket on all of this. Ah, here we go. They don't want us to love Christmas so much and celebrate it the way we do. Oh, you mean like pagans and any other oppressed religions whose traditions were stolen and completely stomped out by ancient Christians to suit their own purposes? What a bunch of snowflakes. There's this one group over here that says, hey, if you wanna sing your songs and do your stuff at Christmas time, that's fine, but tone it down. Don't sing so loud, right? Just, you take your private stuff and you just, Keep it in your house. Don't let it spill out into the public and bother the rest of us. Just keep it tucked in and private. Oh, okay, so I get it. When somebody who's not a Christian tells you to not be so Christian at Christmas, that's oppressive. But if a Christian tells their gay child to do whatever they want with whoever they want, as long as it's behind closed doors and doesn't reflect on them, that's just common decency. It's like we're only two minutes into this movie and it's already being hypocritical. That's gotta be a new record. You know, what are they gonna do next? Tell us hot chocolate's bad for us? That the, the druids invented it? Yes, hot chocolate is bad for you. It's pure sugar, dipshit. And no, the druids didn't invent it. The Aztecs and the Mayans did thousands of years ago, before Christ was even born, you jingoistic armadillo. But heaven forbid you do three minutes worth of research, but that would require reading, now wouldn't it? And if it's anything this movie will attest to, it's that reading things is not your strong suit. So what are we supposed to do? I don't know, how about go fuck yourself and the reindeer you rode in on? Because maybe somewhere along the way, we lost sight of the real story. Maybe we've got it wrong. Kirk Cameron most definitely does have this wrong. Everybody knows that the real story of Christmas is about four teenage mutant ninja turtles trying to find a present for their rat master. Or maybe we're listening to the wrong people. Do any of us really want to know what Kirk Cameron considers to be the right people? Or maybe, just maybe, Someone like Santa Claus is actually on the team? I don't know what team he was talking about, but all of that bullshit was just the first intro to the film. And I do mean first. Stories are tricky things. You're right, Kirk, stories are tricky. It's almost like anybody with an opportunity in a camera can just make up random facts and say that it's true without presenting any evidence whatsoever. Now, I'm not just gonna outright say that you did it, but I will heavily imply it. There was a time when we didn't mind hearing the same stories over and over again. In fact, when we were children, we insisted on hearing them on an endless loop. I mean, yeah, dude, that's because the internet didn't exist. There really wasn't anything else to do except farm and then die at 35, you dingus. And besides, we totally don't have a problem hearing the same story over and over and over again. Do you have any idea how many times Spider-Man has been rebooted over the last 20 years? Uncle Ben has been through a lot. 
Whoa, who the hell is this guy? And what is this very ska Christmas we're having all of a sudden? It's only 76 minutes long, and the first nine minutes of it is just intros! Hey everybody, that's me, enjoying the party. And that's my sister. She's throwing the party. No one loves a Christmas party more than her. And that's Christian, my brother-in-law. And yes, that's his name, as if you haven't been hit over the head with the premise enough already. And he plays Kirk's fake brother-in-law to his real sister. And somehow, that's the least confusing thing about this whole film. He seems to be having a bit of a panic attack when it comes to Christmas for, I don't know, one or twenty reasons. Where some see youthful joy, others see phony smiles and spoiled bratty kids. Where some see laughter and holiday cheer, Others see pretense and obligations. Where some see festive decorations, others see perverted symbols with hidden meanings. Where some see innocent toys, others see pointless distractions. Where some see generosity and the joy of giving, others see needless spending and bad stewardship. Where some see religious persecution, others see total bullshit. See, Kirk? I can do it too. Commercialism. Greed, holiday junk, materialism, paganism, elf worship, the list goes on and on. I mean, yeah, those are all very real and legitimate concerns that people have about how they should celebrate Christmas. But there's a very easy solution to that. Just celebrate it your way. People all over the world have celebrated Christmas in their own way for hundreds and hundreds of years. And to be honest, there's really no wrong way to do it. Unless you're Dutch because it's 2020 and somehow Black Peter is still a thing. Google it. Christian appears to be afraid that the true meaning of Christmas has become lost in the hustle and bustle of the season, and dudes like DeAndre playing the token black guy just yammering in his ear about total nonsense is not helping. What's up, DeAndre? How you been? <laughs> you know me, blessed and highly favored. And? Saved a sanctified filled with the Holy Ghost and that with a burning fire. And? Made evident by speaking in tongues. Of course. <laughs> you guys in your verses. You know, some people would choose to tackle world hunger, or poverty, or war crimes, but DeAndre, man, he knows what's really important. Crazy Shirt Friday. Uh, you get that memo? About oh, what? No more Crazy Shirt Fridays. What? I can't believe they've done this. How could they take away Crazy Shirt Friday? And who the hell are they anyway? The man. Corporate. Oh, yeah. That clears it up. They think they're gonna tell us what to do. If we don't have Crazy Shirt Fridays, it's the end for us. Man, that's all we got. What else do we get? Floor two? I don't want floor two. You know what happens down in floor two? I don't, don't wanna find out, cause I'm on floor four. And I like it that way. We gonna keep it that way. We gonna march if we have to. Straight power, me and you. My people have been through enough. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you just shout straight power and then compare the loss of Crazy Shirt Friday to systemic racism and slavery? And then they start taking over, telling us we can't have Fridays, then you can't have Thursdays, then you can't have Tuesdays, and what's left? Wednesday, hump day, that's already a day. That's not our day, we need a day for us, Crazy Shirt Fridays. If Crazy Shirt Friday is the sword that he's willing to die on, then so be it. But I gotta tell you, if he doesn't stop talking about it soon, I'm gonna let him borrow one of mine. If he doesn't stop talking about it soon, I'm gonna let him borrow one of mine. I'm gonna let him borrow one of mine. I hit my head. I'm gonna hand him one of mine. Ow. Fuck, that really hurt. That took way too many takes. Do you know how many crazy shirts I've got that my wife gave me for Christmas? I'm assuming none because I'm pretty sure you've got a husband and I bet he's just lovely. What am I gonna do with those? That's not me. He's literally talking so much that the movie itself tries to play him off like he's giving a speech at the Oscars. Are you listening to me? What? I'm gonna get some hot chocolate. I'll send you the email again, all right? I'm out. Is there booze or something in the hot chocolate? Because everyone seems to be obsessed with it. It would explain a lot. I mean, Kirk Cameron's already teaching these elementary schoolers how to do whippets, so... Who knows? Hey, Christian! Nope. Not here. Just Bill on the couch. Who the hell is Bill? I don't know, but I feel like I really need to. I can tell you this, if we don't get some more Bill, I'm gonna be so mad. 
Kirk eventually finds Christian outside having a panic attack in his car, and he decides that he is the one best suited to help him through this, and he does this in the worst possible way. Everybody just wants stuff. I look at what Christmas is, and I think to myself, this cannot be what God wants. And and deep and deep in the corner, just stuck in the corner, will be a little snow globe, a little nativity scene, a little baby Jesus. Hey man, nobody, and I mean nobody, puts baby Jesus in a corner. And put put a little glass thing around him, shake it upside down. It's winter, snow falls all over, all over baby Jesus. And then, by the way, he 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 was not born in December. This is not what Christmas is all about. Everything he said is 100% valid, and he's allowed to feel that way. Or at least he would be if Kirk Cameron wasn't there to say this. But this is all wrong. This is all wrong. No, you're all wrong. You, 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 you drank the Kool-Aid. You, you, you took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. It's all about Jesus. And you're spoiling the whole thing, not just for your wife but for everybody inside your house. Oh, fuck you, Kirk Cameron. Who the hell do you think you are? First off, the only person who even noticed he was gone was you. Second, this dude is clearly having some sort of existential crisis about Christmas, and you're telling him and us that he's ruining everything for everybody else because he agrees with you that there should be more Christ in Christmas? Like, how are you gonna justify that? If you had to pick one valuable thing in all of the decorations around your house at Christmas time, it would probably be your nativity set. But Christian, I don't even think you see what's so amazing about that scene. Okay, so you're gonna explain how the nativity scene, which depicts the birth of Jesus, is related to Christmas. How can you possibly screw that up? To think that it's only valuable because the baby Jesus is there misses a huge part of what's going on. First of all, a manger is a feeding trough, and it's probably going to be carved out of a rock. It's going to be in a cave. And upon that rock, you would feed your animals. Get to the point, Seaver! Now move beyond the cute and traditional, where everything is safe and soft, where everyone has white skin and clean clothes. All right, all right, it's only slightly racist, so let's just move past that. What happens next? You need to think of Herod's soldiers moving through the streets, finding babies and murdering them. And mothers weeping for their children. That's fucked up, dude. This got really dark really quick. I'm hoping that you have a point that you're trying to make here. Let's set the stage. The Bible draws our attention to something that we usually think of as just a prop. Let's take away Joseph. Now let's take away Mary leaving the baby. Let's even take away the baby himself for just a moment, because by getting a look at this prop, we'll get a better idea of why he was born in the first place. Swaddling cloth. What is this swaddling cloth? Is it just a blanket for a baby? Yes. We usually only think of the baby Jesus being wrapped in cloths. But the Bible brings these cloths back into the story one more time. At his tomb. When they rolled that stone away. Oh, okay, whoa, 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 say what? Are you saying that Jesus was buried in his swaddling cloth? Or are you trying to make a point about just cloth in general? Did you ever wonder why the wise men brought frankincense and myrrh at Jesus' birth? No, Kirk, but I'm pretty sure you're about to tell us. Those are burial spices. Why would they bring burial spices to a baby shower? The birth scene is a picture of a coming burial scene. So let me get this straight. The birth of Jesus is meant to have predicted the death of Jesus, and the fact that he was wearing cloth at both times is what ties the two together? I mean, we do all start wearing diapers and usually end up wearing diapers in the end, so... Uh... Yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense. Is celebrating the eventual death of a baby the reason that people bring flowers when a baby is born? Oh hey, you just had your baby! Congratulations! Here's some flowers to celebrate its inevitable demise! You're welcome! Let that image paint the picture for you. A baby who came to die. Yes, 
That's the reason for the season, right there. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. For some reason, all of Kirk Cameron's rambling seems to work on Christian. I gotta admit, I never saw the whole swaddling cloth thing. <laughs> I didn't either. Yeah, no one did. Because it's stupid and only a crazy person would dig that deep to find meaning in something so inconsequential as baby Jesus' dirty diapers. I feel like we need to have like little Herod soldiers like all around, you know, the nativity right. for, for people to see like, right. this is this is what's going on, right, right? Right, Is Christian trying to imply that his problem with Christmas will be solved by placing more reminders of child murderers around his house? It's a good thing I got him this John Wayne Gacy cell portrait, otherwise this would have been really awkward. Oh man, DeAndre, what's happening? Oh great, DeAndre's back, and he found a friend. You know what's really going on here? Yes. No. No, 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 I don't. I legitimately believe that line because so far, it's the only one I can relate to. Three words. Popeye's chicken sandwich. You know, they only made so many that first time on purpose. Seriously, how could it be so good? I'm trying to go on a diet here. I got a wedding to go to and it's already hard enough with the McRib being back and everybody knows that that's my favorite sandwich in the whole wide world. And Oh crap, the camera's still rolling. I really want a McRib right now. War on Christmas. Oh, fuck me. I think it would be in our best interest before we go any further. You gotta be really careful. You never know who's listening or watching. Cups up. Oh, okay. All right, man, check this out. We gotta go on the offensive. It's like the rapper Sugar Free said, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. They're already taking away our freedom of speech. I can't say Merry Christmas at work no more. I have to say Happy Holidays, but I am not in the days. I am wide awake. I don't even fully understand exactly why we're doing this because I'm pretty sure that by just switching over to a voiceover that we're actually speaking louder than we were before. And what are you even talking about in the first place? It's deeper than that though. You heard about Area 51? What about Area 52? That's where they're keeping all the mangers and trees and nativity scenes they keep taking down. Come on man, they got fluoride in our water! I'm saying that's gotta cause at least Asperger's. Come on, you got the chemtrails and Harp trying to control the weather with the womp. I saw loose change. I know what's up with the whole Koch brothers, Halliburton, Dick Cheney, Enron, Fannie Mac, Freddie Mae tie-in. But I mean, that's obvious. Look, man, I saw it on Fox News, so you know it's true. War on Christmas. It's everywhere. I have some questions. This whole rant about conspiracies doesn't go anywhere and never gets spoken about ever again. It just ends with the two of them going, So you know what we gotta do, right? The only thing we can do. And then not saying what it is, or doing it. So the only thing I can assume that they have to do to deal with the conspiracy theories is just stop talking about it. It also comes across as really sort of making fun of the people that you would consider to be the target demographic of this movie, which is hard conservative Fox News watchers. In this one scene, it feels like the movie has alienated any potential audience that it could have had, which begs the question, who is this movie even for? And to be honest, the only person I can think of is Kirk Cameron. Speaking of which, Christmas trees are up next on the Kirk Cameron chopping block. Christmas trees. <laughs> Newsflash! Christmas tree, not in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Deuteronomy, I missed it. I miss some Leviticus sometimes but I'm pretty sure it's not in there. Which is true, but he can't really give any actual examples because he's written to be kind of an idiot. That's a pagan, that's a pagan idol symbol worshiping thingy. You know that, right? That's what they would worship the God with. You know the gods. What gods? 
the the gods. Which gods? Thor, Thorsus, Thor, Thor, Cyrus, Thor, Thor. It's always a. Are those gods or Pokemon evolutions? It's either that or some kind of a skin disease. I wonder what the infomercial for that would be like. Hi, I'm small-time internet celebrity and comedy hack John from Homeless Movies. Do you or anyone you know suffer from thoraisis? If so, there may be something that can help. From the maker of Earth, life, and literally everything else in the universe, it's Jesus. Side effects include bigotry, delusions of entitlement and persecution when doing something as simple as buying coffee from Starbucks, the vapors, sudden onset verbal diarrhea, and on occasion, actual diarrhea. Jesus. Remember, if you don't sin, he died for nothing. Where are Christmas trees in the Bible? I'm glad you asked. I'll close my eyes again. Here I go. I'm waiting. Where are we going in the Bible? Genesis. Okay, so see if you can follow along this bit, because I personally had a really hard time with it. Kirk goes on to explain that Christmas trees are representative of the tree of knowledge of good and evil from the Garden of Eden. And the decorations we place on it are meant to be the fruit from which Adam and Eve ate from, which honestly doesn't sound too terribly far-fetched. But this is Kirk Cameron we're talking about. You know he can't just stop there. Let's go back to our story. As I was saying, Adam stole the fruit from God's tree and ate it. Now, when you steal something, you're required to put it back. But how could he? Adam had already eaten it. It had gone down inside and become part of him. So if you're like me in any way, you're probably thinking, well, the only way that Adam could basically put the fruit back on a tree would be for him to poop out the seeds of the thing that he ate, plant them, and then grow another tree. So then you have another tree with fruit. And if you're thinking that, congratulations, you might be considered a rational human being. Kirk Cameron is not that. The only way that Adam could put the fruit back on the tree would be, as crazy as it sounds, he would have to put himself up on that tree. Now think, what did Jesus do? He was the last Adam. He put himself up on a tree, making us right with God. Jesus was God's blessed fruit hung on his blessed tree. Okay, um, what? From what I'm able to gather, this idea that Jesus is the last Adam, which sounds like a badass action movie, by the way, comes from the Gospel of Paul, specifically Colossians 1.15, where he refers to Jesus as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So because Adam was the first person ever created by God, and Jesus was the firstborn son of God, then they are technically the same person, because Jesus needs to have more titles than Daenerys Targaryen at the end of Game of Thrones. So the tree is actually a cross, and Jesus is actually a fruit. Got it. Man, I'm so smart. So when you walk into a Christmas tree lot, I want you to see hundreds of crosses that will never be used because of Jesus' finished work. You do know that people kept being crucified after Jesus, right? Is crucifying the Jesus like the jumping the shark of biblical times? Like, nope, we already done it, can't top it, everything's all downhill from here. Remember kids, any time that you hang that funny Rick and Morty ornament, some tinsel or happy lights or fun little popcorn balls and family photos, it's like you're nailing Jesus to the cross all over again. So when you see empty Christmas trees, see an empty cross. And when you see the empty cross, see the empty cloths lying in an empty tomb. Again with you and the cloth thing! And when you see an empty tomb, do what the disciples did. Turn and run to tell the story that Jesus is alive. And this time, he's pissed. Jesus too! After all that, Christian then apologizes for not seeing the on-the-spot, made-up, symbolic nonsense that Kurt has been feeding him. Um, I almost feel bad. I wasn't, I wasn't looking closely enough. Which he absolutely shouldn't have to do, but we have to remember that Kurt Cameron is the real victim of Christian's anxiety here. Especially when he decides to start going into a weird rant about how Santa is actually the devil. Just think about it. Just th think about it for one minute. That's the guy. Santa. That's... Obliterated Jesus! Jesus is gone! S-A-N-T-A. -A. Rearrange letters. Satan. Santa. Satan. Same letters. 
Look, we all know that that isn't true. We all know that Santa fought the devil in Season 5, Episode 21 of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Kurt tries to tell the story of the real Saint Nicholas, a Catholic bishop who was known for his generosity towards children, and while it sounds innocent enough, it follows the same formula as all of his other explanations. Provide accurate historical information, follow it up with batshit interpretation. Sir? Go away. He's here, sir. Where? Here, at the tavern. Grab my coat. So Santa goes into a cavern, which, judging by all the antlers on the walls, belongs to Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, and sits down next to the conspiracy theory guys from earlier. The bald one is meant to be Arius, a rival bishop whose radical views of how Jesus was not on the same level as God warranted the creation of the First Council of Nicaea by Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. The Council of Nicaea ended up producing what is known today as the Nicene Creed. The creed affirmed the deity of Christ and the three persons of the Trinity. But that affirmation didn't happen without Nicholas and a fight. It's said that during this council, Nicholas became so enraged with Arius' heresy that he got up and slapped him in the face. So those are the historical facts. How does Kirk Cameron interpret that fight? In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was Dumpster! After whooping Arius' ass, Santa goes back home to meet the same girl who told him what was going on in the first place, and she just starts, like, making fun of him for doing it? Oh, look who it is. Better? You get that out of your system? What the hell? I thought you were friends! And then Santa gives you the creepiest smile you've ever seen and then says, Come on, let's go bless some kids tonight. We've got gifts to give. <laughs> Uh, no thanks, Santa. I think I'll pass this time. And somehow, somehow, all of this convinces Christian that he's the bad guy in the story. Oh, uh, dude, I am. I'm that guy in the story. I'm the jerk. No, Christian, Kirk is a jerk. You're just an idiot. You know what you need to do? You need to be the guy who walks back into your house, walks up to your wife, and says, I was wrong. I blew it. What did he blow, exactly? No one else at the party seemed to give a shit that he was even there, and it's at Christian's house. But that was before he believed in Christmas. Now Christian has taken up the mantle as the one who needs to save Christmas, and how's he gonna do it? Looks like somebody's having a moment. By bursting into the door, Kirk Cameron on his shoulder whispering in his ear like the devil, Now see Christmas through new eyes. And then Christian running in and murdering everyone. Whoa, whoa, back up everybody! <laughs> the end. At least it's how I wished it would end. The last half hour of this movie is made up of primarily two things. One, Kirk Cameron tries to justify everything that he just said for the last 45 minutes to Christian to us. And two, a choreographed dance sequence of an all-white hip-hop troupe oh, angels we have filled with awkward slow motion, extremely bored-looking children, and one really, really intense dude at the end. 
Before the credits roll, Kirk makes one final voiceover speech about how much he just loves Christmas, and how Christians need to not be afraid to be Christians at Christmas time, and how it's their duty to educate the world on the right way to celebrate Christmas. Because if you're not Christian, or even the right Kirk Cameron type of Christian, you're doing it wrong. Unless they're the Dutch, fuck those guys. Let me know down in the comments what you guys thought of the video and what movie you think I should talk about next. Click the like button and share this video with your friends and make sure to thank my members and patrons who have continued to support me throughout this entire year. 2020 has been really, really hard and I couldn't have been there without you. Thank you guys so much. Click over here to subscribe and watch another video. Thank you all so much for watching. I love you. I'll see you next time. Happy holidays and just remember, be cool to each other. <laughs>